well, you know, Jesus is saving the world, you know what I mean? And Buddha is saving the world. And uh, it saves itself all the time, you know? So I think people have to really save themselves. Don't you think? Like Dalai Lama always says, world peace through inner peace. And I think that still remains the, the watchword. Isabel Losada also had a good slogan, I think, who wrote that English book from Tibet with love, or for Tibet with love. But then they made a mistitle of it here in the US, and there's some stupid thing, how to save the world, actually. <laughs> stupid title. Uh, because they didn't want to put Tibet in there, you know. Some American publisher, you know. But anyway, her slogan is quite good. It says, think globally, act joyfully. I think that's a really good one. So I think the main thing is to be happy, you know. And forget about saving the world. Why save the world? Let it blow up. Who gives a damn? People will be reborn somewhere else. And if they have to blow it up one more time, they have blown it up millions of times. If they have to blow it up another time, then they'll go through the whole freak out all together, like Obi-Wan Kenobi shuddering in the movement of the Force, as they create a new world, which they'll then live on and then hopefully not blow that one up. But of course, I don't believe that uh, the Obalokiteshvara and Vajrapani and uh, the Sphere Hayagriva, they're going to allow them to do it. I have actually seen it, but they didn't allow them to do it. They would have done it in Nixon's time otherwise. In Brezhnev's time, they were planning to. And uh, so they won't be allowed to blow it up, you know. So the main thing is everybody should become joyful, aware of the nature of reality themselves. And then they will see the world being saved by enlightened beings. And then they will become enlightened beings and that will add to the saving. Do you know what I mean? So the idea of objectifying a world out there that has to be saved is a huge mistake. Because it puts the people who are trying to save it into the same almost materialistic game of the people who are trying to dominate it and who are destroying themselves and the world, are running after some sort of outer objective thing as if that would help them. And that they'll be happy when, I'll be happy when I'm rich and famous and I'm a big shot in Hollywood. Ha, ha, ha. They'll be, you'll just have a higher grade of Prozac when that happens. You won't be happier, not at all. Only be happy when you're happy with what you are and what you have and what there is, right? So that's the key thing, don't you think? So how to save the world? I don't know about the title. <laughs> but it's good. It's good. We all want to save the world, you know. The solution, the Dalai Lama, okay, my book, his act of truth, you see. But, but I don't say that he's the solution for the world. I say his act of truth is the solution. You know what the act of truth is? It underlies Gandhi's idea of satyagraha. And it means, uh, I think, I guess, satyakarma or something like that. It would have been in ancient time. Actually, I would, I'm not sure what the Sanskrit term they use, but I think satyakarma. And uh, it means that uh, whatever the external situation seems to be, one acts according to the truth, even if it seems to be impossible or it makes you weaker or whatever. And then there's the famous story about the courtesan who confronted the Emperor Ashoka over something in Patna. And, I can't, and that I can't remember who, what it was. And uh, she said, if what I'm saying is the truth, let the Ganges flow backwards so you, your majesty, will see. And then the Ganges turned backwards and far from the ocean. You couldn't have a tide as high up as Patna. You know? It's hundreds of miles upstream. You know? And uh, the other famous one is the King of Shibi. You know the story of the King of Shibi? King of Shibi was a previous life of the Buddha. It's a Jataka story. And a um, blind beggar who probably was incarnation of Indra, usually in that case, but I can't remember, came in and said, and he was very famous. He had beautiful blue eyes, very famous for them, and said, I've heard you have the best eyes in the kingdom, and I want those eyes. I'm blind, and I've heard you're very generous. Please give me your eyes. So the King of Shibi was like, Fantastic! Someone asked me something really difficult. I love it. Okay, call the surgeons. You're going to have them. And then the, all the queens are weeping and the ministers are freaking out. A blind king, the country will go to ruin, the thieves will come, the enemies will never know what to do. You can't do this, Your Majesty, or to the kingdom. No, what are you talking about? I'm going to do it. I can run the kingdom. Fine, blind, you'll be my friend and help me. I'm going to give my eyes. This is a great culmination of my life. You don't realize this is the best thing that could happen to me. 
calls in the surgeons. They're all freaking out. He then says, don't give me anesthetic. I don't want to be out unconscious. And then you mess it up and then tell me you couldn't do it. I want to be awake for the whole thing. And so they took out his eyes and they transplanted them into the other guy. And people are still having a spaz, you know. So finally he says, okay, you people have not believed me. If it is true that it is the greatest joy of my existence to give my eyes to this blind beggar, then may my eyes be restored. So you people will be happy too. And bam, his eyes were back and the beggar was also seeing. So that's the act of truth. You know I mean, it accomplishes the miraculous, the impossible based on truth, even as people find it unbelievable. So the truth that people find unbelievable about the Dalai Lama is what he has said since 1988, that the uh, nonviolence is the way of the 21st century. We will not be having these wars. They are a mistake. They're just a carryover, a spillover from the idiot Bushes and the idiot Cheneys and the Halliburtons and the whole dumb business from the, the century of the superpowers and that from the century of the imperialists, you know. And superpowers are just what I call not quite post-colonialists. And um, they say they're post-colonialists, but in fact they're not. And uh, we're going to have a century of dialogue, and nonviolence is going to be the power. Nonviolence will rule. And that's, what, that's the truth. And therefore, he really liberating Tibet by refusing to fight in a violent way, refusing to hate the rulers of China. Refu even his own people, when they get over, go overboard and scream too roughly, he says, no, that's not working. And actually, if you look at the Tibet movement in America, for years I have gone to the protests here in Tibet, here in, uh, in New York or, or there in New York or everywhere. And then the Tibetans, you know, Tibet for Tibetans and all that, that's okay. But then they get very hepped up and they get more bloody, their T-shirts, and they go, China out of Tibet and shame on China. And so because they do overflow emotionally like that and they threw a couple of rocks, I mean, people say they all threw rocks, but they didn't, just one or two at the Chinese embassy. But because of that, they have not in 25 years, 35 years I've been going there for their March 10th demonstration, they have not basically persuaded the Chinese American community in the United States, which is a powerful multi-million person community, which would really give them the clout that they need both with China and with the US. They have not gotten them on board because the Chinese think they're against them and they're anti-China, which actually the Tibet movement is pro-China. So save the world, is, this is the key thing, is like, let go of the world. Let it go. We're going to be happy. Whatever. You know? And with happiness, we'll do everything we can to help others. But uh, we're not going to get angry if we see someone destroying the world. We're going to feel sorry for them. Because we're going to realize that our life is beyond this world. Uh, we are not quite, you said transcendent nation, that's better. The nation transcends any particular life. It's a multi-life, infinite entanglement. And uh, so uh, let's, like, let's give up the world, actually. We'll save it by giving it up. Every day you present the mandala offering, what it's called. In the mandala offering, you offer Mount Meru and the four continents and all the living beings and yourself and all your property and possessions, and you offer it to the enlightened beings because the unenlightened ones can't take care of it. They mess it up. They constantly destroy it and themselves. So the enlightened beings have to take care of it, you know.